Hey, good morning, everybody. It's uh, just about 10.01, so we're going to get rolling. I think people are still filtering in from the waiting room. So uh, those of you who are with us, we appreciate you. Thanks for joining us today. We're going to have a discussion of the federal financing vehicles that have been put in place in response to the uh, this insane outbreak that we're all dealing with. Um, obviously, we're all worried about our families, uh, our coworkers, our customers, vendors. Um, and we're also worried about our business and our ability to continue to operate uh, in, in, this, in this crazy time. So we're going to talk about what's available, uh, what's currently in place. And we're also going to talk about some, you know, what we anticipate still to come. Um, mostly, though, we want to take your questions. So you're going to tell us uh, what you want to talk about. And that's really what this is about. We'll have limited presentation. It will mostly be um, uh, a conversation. Um, here's, here's how we're going to handle that, the conversation, because we've got a number of people on the line, so we can't unmute everybody uh, to, to, to take questions. What we do have is at the bottom of your screen, or maybe on the side, actually, uh, you'll have a button that says Q&A, and that is actually the Q&A button. So if you click that, uh, that's where you can um, ask your questions. Now, when you see the questions that are already in the queue, if your question is similar to one that's already there, you can upvote it, and that'll tell us, uh, that'll give us some sense of, of what people are most interested in discussing. Um, you have the option of submitting a question anonymously, but I discourage that because uh, if you um, submit it with your name, I can unmute you and we can actually have a little dialogue, which I think you know is ideal. Um, you can ask clarifying questions and, and give us your thoughts as well. So uh, you know I'd encourage you to to not uh, don't be anonymous. Um, I'm looking at who's there, and I know a bunch of you anyway. And so if your tone of, tone of voice is such, I can probably suss out who you are if, you, if you're anonymous. You can also virtually raise your hand by clicking the hand button on your toolbar, and I can unmute you, and, and we can have dialogue that way. But let's let's work with the Q&A box uh, is really the best way of doing this. Um, so uh, a couple of the questions we always get at these things. Yes, this is being recorded and it will be available on the uh, NAD COVID-19 resource page, probably, uh, if not later today, tomorrow. And we'll email everybody a link to it, along with any presentation slides, which I think we only have a few. Um, and, but you'll have all that information. You can forward it to people, and, and, and hopefully we'll give you some good information today and help you uh, make your decisions. Um, Scott Iver, would you go ahead and launch our poll? We're trying something new, live without a net, everybody. We've got a polling feature in this um, in, in this Zoom meeting that we haven't tried before, but we're gonna we're gonna try it uh, live without a net here to get a sense of where everybody on the call is uh, with in, in in the process of of accessing any of these federal programs. Uh, I think we we specified the PPP program, which seems to be from talking to a lot of our members where everybody's looking that's the most obvious place for us to to go and that's what we're going to spend most of our time talking about so if uh, scott can launch that poll i'm not sure what your experience will be answering it but again we'll give it a shot and if it doesn't work we'll pretend that the last 30 seconds never happened so who's joining us today uh with us we have uh nad member john kane of wise way supply in uh, covington kentucky um He's uh, been very involved with the Finance Committee of NAD in the past, our board of directors. Uh, John, would you kind of tell us a little bit about yourself and about Wiseway? Yeah, uh, I own Wiseway Supply. We have, uh, and I know this now because of the application, uh, roughly about 118 FTEs. Uh, we're located, we, we service the central Ohio to central Kentucky mar markets. Our headquarters are in Florence, Kentucky, just uh, part of the greater Cincinnati market. Uh, we are in the plumbing and electrical business. Um, that's uh, we have ten locations, and that's uh, a little bit about our demographics. Lawrence, I apologize. I should know better. Uh, Jen Bach is with us, and she's a partner in the tax practice at Brown Smith and Wallace here in St. Louis, Missouri. 
I've known Jen for many years. We've worked together on NAD finance issues. Jen, thanks for joining us. Tell us a little bit about yourself and about BSW. Absolutely. Thanks, Ed, absolutely for the opportunity to be here and hopefully help your members understand this very complex area. I hope everyone is doing well. Um, as Ed said, we've worked together for years. I've been with Brown Smith Wallace now almost 20 years. So it's uh, it's been a lot of fun to see that firm grow and to see NAAD grow and Ed and his development and everything that he does fantastic for the organization as a whole. So it's a great opportunity to be here, hopefully to help you understand more what your obligations are as well as your opportunities. So in being part of the nonprofit practice of the firm, um, I think there's a lot of opportunity here to be able to share this information with you. And my colleague, David, as well is on the line. So we'll, we'll let him take over from here if you wanna move on over to him. Yeah, David Killian is principal in BSW's Transaction Advisory and Litigation Support Services practice. Uh, David, why don't you uh, tell, us, um, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do for BSW? Certainly. Uh, nice to meet everyone on the line. As To echo Jen's comments, hopefully this webinar is helpful to get you some of the high-level details on what's out there from a stimulus standpoint. So I, I've been with the firm for a little bit over a year now. Uh, my, my day job, as I call it, is really more so on the transaction side. So helping small and mid-sized business owners um, either get ready for a sale or go out and do acquisitions. So along with that, comes a lot of experience uh, on the finance side. So I, I work with banks and I've worked with banks for a lot of years. I, I've done SBA loans myself on acquisitions, helped business owners do SBA loans. So that experience really lent itself to what has been my focus for probably three weeks now. 100% um, has been on the SBA lending side and, and digesting the EIDL program as well as the PPP program. So that's been my focus and I uh, look forward to answering questions and helping everyone out on the call with uh, with the opportunities that are out there. Thanks, David. Now, David tells me that his webcam is broken. And if you buy that, I got the bridge in Brooklyn, I'm gonna sell you. We'll let him <laughs> slide this time though, because I think he's not charging us for today. Uh, Jen and David, I think let's start off um, with you guys kind of telling us a little bit about what we know about what's out there right now. Um, I know there's been some changes since the program was rolled out, uh, and, and I think there continues to be some adjustments made. So if you kind of set the stage for us of where we are, um, I think that would help uh, frame the conversation for us. Sure. Um, and, and Jen and I have a, a one-pager as, as well as a lot of documents on our website, um, another webinar we did that was recorded. So lots of resources out there for anyone who wants to take a little bit deeper dive into this. But what, what our plan was is to, to hit three or four of the highlights, um, which I'll go through and then turn it over to Jen and then let her wrap it up. So what we have are two programs, as was mentioned earlier, we have the EIDL program, uh, which stands for Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, as well as the Paycheck Protection Program, or, or PPP, or PPL. A lot, of, a lot of acronyms getting thrown around there, so hopefully no one has been too confused over those. But um, the, the EIDL program is, is a disaster relief program. COVID-19 was a declared disaster nationwide. These are loans administered directly through the SBA at sba.gov. It is an online application process. The, the loan window is um, now through the end of the year. These are open generally to small businesses with less than 500 employees, nonprofits, um, sole proprietors, independent contractors, ESOPs. So lots of eligibility there. Um, they're $2 million loan maximum. Um, 30 year maximum, and then a, a one year payment deferral. So th those have been appealing um, and, and less appealing for reasons that, that Jen will get into as it relates to the PPL. But, the, but like I said, these are done directly through the SBA, not a lender. So you'll work with an underwriter um, at the SBA to calculate the loan amount. It's a very facts and circumstances based loan dependent on your business's downturn as it relates to COVID-19. So, so that's option one. Yeah, go ahead. What was the interest rate? Interest rate 3.75. Yep, and, and we're splitting this up. So Jen will have some more details. We, we've kind of divided our, 
our uh, responsibilities in half here. Um, so we, and, and she'll get into some more. But the uh, the so the PPP program. This is the forgivable loan, quote unquote, CARES Act program that is very popular right now, and, and it's popular because of its forgiveness provisions. So this is available through FDIC institutions, uh, credit unions, as well as the farm credit system. The loan period is February 15th through June 30th. That's also known as the covered period under the provisions. Um, you know, keep in mind that this is a first come first serve program. So while it's open through the end of June, it's funded at least currently to the extent of 349 billion. <clears throat> we, we are hearing discussions already that there's gonna be another 250 billion allocated to it. But nothing is is set in stone, and and with the way Washington moves, um, you know we're, we're not putting a lot of onus on that right now, or or certainty. So we'll we'll wait and see. But generally speaking, the program is open to small business concerns, um, 501c3 nonprofits, 501c19 tax exempt veteran organizations. It is also open to sole proprietors, independent contractors, and self employed individuals. There are there are some exceptions that came out. Um, you know, to say this thing has been moving is <laughs> is certainly an understatement. Jen and I have spent a lot of nights trying to keep up with everything. Um, it's you know it's a moving target for sure. But the most recent guidance came out that if you are an organization with greater than 500 employees, but you meet the NAICS standards that that may allow you to qualify for a basis beyond that, you would qualify. There's also an, an alternative sizing standard if you're less than 15 million of, of net worth and 5 million average after-tax income for the last two years, you may be eligible as well. So lots of questions around eligibility that it, it continues to broaden because they want to open this up to as many organizations who need it as possible. So. Certainly something to consult with um, your accountant or attorney or lender to, to confirm eligibility and also confirm your interpretation that you're not eligible is very important. Um, loan amount is going to be 10 million maximum or um, whichever is less, the average monthly payroll for the last 12 months times 2.5. Average monthly payroll can be calculated on a trailing 12-month basis, or it can be based on 2019 payroll numbers. That is something we're asking all of our clients to confirm with their lender. Those options do exist. Some lenders have different preferences, so please confirm that. There is an interplay here um, between the PPL and the EIDL that I explained a few minutes ago. To the extent that you receive an EIDL loan, you will have to remove that, or I'm sorry, add that piece to your PPL loan. So the government is asking any idle loan um, recipients who receive this as it related to COVID-19 to put those loans together as one, you know, sort of a, a quote unquote refinancing. The other piece of it is that the idle loan right now is offering a $10,000 emergency grant. So if you apply for an idle loan, you can elect to receive $10,000 of that upon application. It is supposed to be funded in three days, but is, has been more like five has been my experience. So the, the calculation of that loan amount is going to be the average monthly payroll times 2.5 plus the idle less the emergency grant. So something to, to keep in mind if you've done both. Those loans are two-year term uh, six month deferral and 1% interest. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jen to get into some of the expenses, um, forgiveness as well as certifications. Thanks, David. Yeah, so obviously you can tell from uh, everything that David walked through, there's a, a myriad of lists in the uh, opportunities for what you can be considered to be an eligible recipient of this type of funding. So again, just to reiterate that maximum loan size is capped at either the 10 million or that average payroll cost times that 2.5 multiplier. So once you've actually got, once you've actually received your lending or you have that funding available and you know how much you're able to get, 
then you really need to know how you can spend that money, right? Because we wanna make sure that if we've received the money through the PPP program, that we're actually using it the way that it's designed to. And if we kind of take a step back and think about the act as a whole, so the CARES Act was truly designed to be a opportunity for employers to keep their employees employed and paid. So the goal there, obviously, then for a covered and eligible expense is payroll costs, your actual wages, your salaries, your cash compensation, um, any of the vacation, paternal, sick, or other family leave that you're providing. If you have any allowances from the separation or uh, dismissal costs, if you have employee benefits that you're continuing to cover, whether it be from a health perspective or from a retirement plan perspective, those are all included in eligible payroll costs. The other things that are in there will also be mortgage interest or a rent liability and utilities, but only if those obligations were in place prior to February 15th of 2020. And the significance with that date, as David alluded to, is the fact that the covered period for PPP is from February 15th through June 30th. So if you had those three obligations, either the rent liability, the mortgage interest, or a utility obligation, and it was in place before 215, that would be a covered expense for the loan proceeds. Um, other things that are included in there are the interest on any other debt obligations that you had in place prior to 215. And then as David alluded, the uh, government has decided to include the idle financing in there as well. So if you refinance an idle loan that had been obtained um, after July 31st, excuse me, after January 31st through April 3rd, those can be included as well. The big component of PPP and the big driver for the attraction, obviously, is the forgiveness opportunity. So if you spend the proceeds of the loan appropriately, then you are able to supply that documentation back to the lender and have that portion forgiven. So from an example perspective, um, if you were to take and say you qualified for a million dollar loan and you take that million dollars and you spend it on those appropriate payroll costs that we just talked about, and then you spend some of it on rent expenses and the utility costs, as long as you spent at least 75% of those funds on the appropriate payroll component and less than 25% on the other component, the other mortgage interest or utility, uh, the other idle financing or other interest obligations, as long as you stayed within that 75-25 split and you provide the appropriate documentation to your lender, then that full capacity should be eligible for forgiveness. So that's a huge component because the other qualification that we've heard is that that forgiveness won't be treated as cancellation of indebtedness income, which is a huge coup for anybody that's in a profitable organization, right? Usually when the IRS says, hey, we're going to you know, allow you to cancel a debt, it usually circles back on you and kind of bites you in the rear end because then it becomes taxable. So they have said that there won't be a tax component to it. There's been some speculation as to whether or not there might be a uh, maybe an, another way around that that they try to implement, but we haven't heard anything yet. So as of right now, you supply the appropriate documentation and then you're eligible to have that component forgiven. Um, as with anything that comes from a lending perspective, there's always a certification that's required. So on the PPP programming, you know, David talked about the fact that we, um, we did a webinar on Friday. And when we talked through the, the certifications for that webinar on Friday, we had four things that a lender and an applicant had to confirm with their application, four. That later changed to be eight. So there are eight certifications that have to be made in good faith. And those range from the fact of the organization was in existence as of February of uh, 2020, there's the economic hardship that there's the need for this because of the current circumstances. Um, you're gonna use the money for your worker and payroll retention purposes, that you will provide eligible expense documentation, that you're using the funds appropriately, that you're only taking one PPP loan. Each organization is only allowed one loan um, in order to be in compliance and that you're really honestly supplying true and honest statements. And those statements, if found to be untrue, could be punishable by very significant fines and, and imprisonment. So it's a very serious application. And I know that's usually buried into every loan application somewhere. We just wanna make sure that everyone is aware that this is a big component here. And the final thing is that you're gonna provide the appropriate tax documentation to corroborate you know, what you put in your application. So 
kind of the, the quick summary of those eligible expenses, the forgiveness component and required documentation, the certifications, that is all on PPP. So from the perspective of the idle loans that David was talking about earlier, the eligible expense thing doesn't exist. It's not applicable. Same for the forgiveness component. Idle is not forgivable. As David mentioned, it can be refinanced into these SBA PPP loans. Um, and if you were to apply for an idle, you do a, a brief self-certification that basically says that you're qualified. So kind of kind of the differences between the two. So Ed, that's that's what we know. And, and we do, as David mentioned, we have a, a quick kind of a one page or cheat sheet that highlights at a very high level these summarized items. And we'd be happy to make that available once uh, we have it open for for public consumption. Great. Yeah. And, and uh, that's something that uh, we'll pass along to everybody once it is once it's been blessed by the BSW legal gurus, the powers that be. Um, all right, I don't know if you all can see the, the poll results or not, but it looks like uh, we got some responses there. And, and most of you are in that um, you submitted your application and you're awaiting your response. Um, looks like 10%, just under 10% of you actually have received funding so far. And uh, one of those 10% who has received funding so far is John Kane, who may have been the first person on planet Earth to receive funding under this thing. Yeah, I was, I was fortunate. I, I can walk you through my, my process if you, if you want. I, uh, it, it, was, it was as soon as I heard about this, and my family will tell you, I always want to get to the amusement park a half hour before it opens, because uh, I always find that if you're first in line, or if you start things early, you get in line first, you get to ride the ride first. And that's the way this kind of worked out too. As soon as I started hearing about it, I sent a, an email to my accountant and my banker saying, you all know my business. Tell me what uh, is available out there that's going to help me. I had been familiar or reading about the PPP program. And uh, I, I, as I started reading it, I actually... Uh, was kind of riding side saddle with my bankers. Uh, I, I had the uh, my my direct banker involved, and then the market president of the bank. By the way, I I think one of the reasons for my success is I went with a uh, um, community bank. Uh, I think they're about eight billion dollars in assets, as compared to these you know behemoths, uh, the chases and, and and stuff like that. Uh, uh, and, and the great big banks seem to be having a whole lot more problems than the community banks do. Uh, but anyway, I went with the, uh, I, I was, I was involving my direct banker and the, the market president and uh, made sure I was high on their radar screen. Uh, I think I turned in four applications to them because they, as, as, as Jen uh, alluded to uh, things kept changing and and so they would come back asking for more information. Now they had a whole, because I was there, I was one of their clients. They already had a whole lot of the information because I already had a line of credit with them and, and that kind of thing. So they had, that made my application a little bit easier. Really what I had to provide was the payroll information, some, some of the transactional level of detail, uh, a lot of the corporate type of documentation I didn't need to. And incidentally, my bank, and I've heard this from several uh, that a lot of the banks are, are prioritizing their own customers first in this before they'll consider taking somebody who they do not have a relationship with. And, and uh, so I, I think that was, that's meaningful to know because I, I know there's people who were checking with a lot of different banks. Uh, but anyway, I, I remember uh, the last application I put in was at about 1145 on Thursday night before the program started on on Someone Friday. Oops, sorry. Oh. Sorry about that. Uh, anyway, I uh, turned that in about 1145, uh, right before midnight uh, on Thursday night. I got an email from my banker at 740 in the morning on Friday that they had they had already submitted it. Uh, so I, I, I was very early and I, I I, I could express how I, what a role I think that played is getting in early. And even throughout the day, because they, the bank actually has to underwrite it and they have to be comfortable with everything. I do believe that every bank has their own level of detail they're requiring and they may, all the banks are asking different questions. They all have the same boxes they have to check with the SBA, but 
uh, I think they're they're ultimately the ones uh, responsible for making sure the the due diligence is proper. Uh, so e even throughout the day Friday, I think I had to turn in because because the SBA actually changed the loan application, and I think I had to fill out a new application on Friday, uh, and to speed my loan up, there was a couple things I was trying to fit in that I think ultimately would have. But they cautioned me, you know, said, don't try to make your loan $25,000 higher and it gets hung up somewhere because you're trying to get another $25,000 and you, you miss out on the $800,000 loan or whatever your loan is going to be. So I did trim some of the some of the inclusions back. Uh, but but once I got that in, I got I got word about uh, mid morning on Saturday that my loan had been approved from the standpoint of the SBA had had issued the guarantee to the lender. So, I, and and there, there's several things. And I, I think the, the big challenge once we have the loan is making sure we do comply with all those uh, parameters and, and things to, to go in. One of the things I had to convince my bank of, and I think it's clearer now, I think the SBA has made it clear, I, I made an acquisition last year. So my, my payroll and the, the chief driver of the loan size uh, was bigger because I made that acquisition uh, about a third of the way into 2019. They originally started out wanting me to use 2019 numbers. And, and I said, no, I want to use trailing 12 months. Uh, and because that, that made my, the, the chief driver of my loan, my payroll was a lot higher because of the acquisition. So uh, they finally agreed to that. So I guess you know, I'm sure that all along they're 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 checking these kind of parameters. Uh, I think that there's some neat stuff uh, when it comes to the usage. You can also I, I understand you get to use. Uh, there's two different time periods. You can determine your FTEs for comparison purposes uh, uh, going forward as we as we think about the forgiveness side of this. One way I looked at it is whether it's a 1% loan, so whether it all gets forgiven or not, 1% uh, is cheaper than the line of credit I had. And uh, so whether, it, like I said, whether it gets forgiven or not, it still is beneficial to the company because my, uh, my uh, line of credit is, is uh, uh, three and a quarter percent. It's a prime right now. Uh, so that's, if nothing else, it's a two and a quarter percent savings. Uh, from the for forgiveness standpoint, now my company is 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 ninety five percent construction based, and we're still relatively busy right now. In fact, our our March this year was over our March last year. Uh, but I, I I think from what I'm hearing uh, through the channels is that construction is uh, the the real impact is going to be two or three months from now. So I, I think this this loan will help us uh, uh, meet the uh, maintenance uh, maintenance of payroll issues. Uh, we we are down about ten percent. I don't want to uh, in, in sales uh, through the month of April so far. I don't want to make it sound like uh, things are great because it's not. And we have we have trimmed payroll actually already. But uh, I do think the if you're in the construction business and your market hasn't been shut down like a lot of them have, uh, several have that uh, it could help us out with the parameters of the of the loan. Um, great thoughts, John. And I guess um, for the benefit of those who are kind of going through the exploration of this right now, can you maybe just take a step back and, and talk a little bit about your thought process and, and, and and how you prioritize needs in terms of, you know, you're making an ask for, a, for an amount of money. And you indicated, look, there was some marginal uh, funding I could have gone after, but decided that the, the upside wasn't there based on how it might impact the, the speed that I, with which I could get the bulk of what I needed. How did you prioritize those different, um, those different needs in your ask? I was I was way more concerned about getting the loan and uh, overall than getting another twenty five or fifty thousand dollars added to the loan, uh, and so it, it wasn't it wasn't I mean the payroll is the chief driver and, and so that that's a a pretty easy number to come up with, and that's how that's what that's what was uh, chief driver for me, right, and and as as it was intended right, so right. you had mentioned that. 
that there was some flexibility in terms of the time period uh, that you that they wanted 19 and you wanted a, a moving average was where okay so help us understand where the expressed 2019 is is in the is in the 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 design of the program but you were able to get some flexibility around that is that from your lender or from the SBA or it, how does that how, what are the mechanics of that I believe I believe the SBA has now uh, provided guidance on this, uh, and I think maybe they did between uh, when this process started and when I actually got my loan approved. Uh, but I mean, my case was pretty clear just because of the acquisition. It wasn't like I, I mean, it, the bankers totally understood my case, and I think at the end of the day, they they were trying to. I mean, I I always felt like my banker really was trying to help me get this loan. Uh, by the way, one of the reasons I wanted to get in very early is this is a limited pot of money and right now, and it's first come, first served. Uh, I read an article that they're expecting the total applications to be uh, about a trillion dollars. So that means roughly two-thirds of the people who apply or two-thirds of the dollar amounts that apply are going to be unhappy because uh, they're not going to get it unless uh, you know there's a phase four funding from Congress. And and uh, anyway, so that that's the main reason I didn't hold out for that extra extra money yeah so um the latest we've heard from the sba and this is as of midday yesterday um the sba said that there were more there were more than three hundred eighty-one thousand applications in process totaling 100 billion dollars from more than 3600 lending institutions nationwide um the uh the uh, the Congress is uh, intending to um, to add uh, more funding to this thing to the to to the amount uh, to the to the tune of getting get close to six hundred million dollars when all is said and done. The issue is Congress is not in Washington and uh, they're on break until the end of April. Um, now technically they could do this via voice vote and what's called a unanimous consent thing. But only takes one member of Congress in the in the uh, in the building to, to voice objection. And, By the way, that, that guy that guy unfortunately is my congressman. Is what's his name? Massey is my congressman. Massey. Yeah. Well, you know what, John? There were once upon a time we actually worried about spending in this country, but that's all yeah. gone. So we're not going to start now. But yeah, so if Massey's there, maybe you need to go over to his house and 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 block him in. Uh, but that's how they'll do this. They they they, they want to try and uh, increase the amount available uh, still this week and do it by voice vote. So we'll see how that works out. Um, we've got a few questions in queue, but I want to jump back uh, to Jen and David quickly and try. You know, John talked a little bit about um, how he went with a community bank with which he has an existing relationship, and and I just want to think about. I want to encourage everybody on the line to think about this from the bank's perspective. And I wanted you guys to kind of help me understand what, what's the calculus that the bank has now, just intuitively uh, I'm no big city finance man, but uh, when I look at this, if I'm a bank and, and you already owe me X amount of dollars, you have, you know, you're already into me for something. Uh, I, I have a vested interest in, in sort of prioritizing your liquidity over somebody who's just, you know, a bar and grill who's come to me for that, that we don't have an existing relationship. So Jen and David, if you wouldn't mind speaking a little bit about uh, this from the banker's perspective. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in and get started and then let David chime in too. And it's a great point, right? Because if, if you're working with your local lender, they already know you. To your point, they already know that you owe them money, and given the light of what's going on currently in the uh, in the economic conditions in your local area, if they are able to help you get this loan put through to keep your people paid and keep functioning from an operations perspective, it gives them a lot of security in knowing that they're going to stay current with their existing loans with you. So. I think that does have some insight into why some of the banks are noting that if they already have a business relationship with you and a lending relationship with you, 
that you're going to have a little bit more priority in their processing decisions. Um, obviously, then the next tier is typically going to be somebody that maybe they already know you have a cash reserve fund or you've got depository accounts, and they're going to be less inclined to maybe work with you or have the capacity to make time if you don't already have that relationship. So it makes absolute sense. Um, for me, in, in some of the, the nonprofit background perspectives, it kind of gives an illusion of maybe a conflict of interest, right? Because it's kind of a self-serving decision process. But obviously, there's an overall intent to keep things moving. And there's the overall intent of keeping the people funded. So I, I think that component definitely gets outweighed in this, in this market. But you do want to start where you're known, because that's going to keep that process much more uh, fluid. You know, as John had commented, his bank knew him. So they didn't have to go through the the details and the red tape of knowing their customer, which is you know part of the banking regulations as a whole, they have to know who they're lending to. I think that's from the Terrorist Act from what, maybe back in 2010 or 11, something like that, uh, whenever that got passed. So being able to know your customers is a huge benefit. And if you're already working with someone, like in John's case, you're gonna be able to go back and maybe make loan modifications or modify your application as new guidance comes out. So you have more leeway there. David, I know you've been speaking with some of the bankers locally here in the St. Louis market and maybe even a little bit more widespread. Have you heard any other insights that would be helpful for folks on the call to, to hear? Um, you know, I, I haven't heard anything to the contrary of what you just said. Generally speaking, your existing relationship is the place to start because Banks have more applications than bodies at this point. So start with that relationship. Even bankers are even um, using, using a triage approach with their existing relationships to favor, you know, those who are in commercial lending versus those who are simply depository. One, one thing I will say, though, um, and it touches a little bit on this subject, is from a community banking standpoint versus a... Um, I'll use Bank of America as an example, but pick any giant national bank. So when legislation like this comes out and there is not clear cut guidance coupled with an acceleration of dispersing funds and pressure from the government to get money in hand, the, the big banks have countless numbers of branches and lending officers that they have to educate on the process. So if I'm Bank of America, and I'm uncertain at the corporate HQ level, and I have to roll this out, there, there's inherently a lag between funds being available and funds being dispersed because they have to get their policies in order. Whereas if I'm a small, and, and we're in St. Louis, um, I, I know of a, a specific credit union here in St. Louis that's a, a decent sized lender in this market, but certainly small. Their, their entire brain trust making these decisions is sitting under one roof, talking with one another, saying, how are we going to approach this? If it takes a giant national global bank a week to make a decision, it takes these guys about an hour. They, they are funding loans faster. They're coming to decisions quicker. They're interpreting rules based on common sense. And so I think that's the big difference I'm seeing from a from a big bank versus a community bank is, is that that red tape and decision-making process is done much more at the local level. It's done quicker. So something to think about. If, if you're with a big bank and it isn't moving quickly and you have availability to a smaller local bank that might be moving faster, um, certainly something worth exploring. But, but back to Jen's point, there's there is so much volume out there that, that I think these guys are even underwater as well. But um, you know, just just something to keep in the back of your mind. Boy, how about Wells Fargo? Uh, they hit their ten billion dollar or their own cap uh, government pose cap. Talk about uh, running off some customers, uh, small businesses that can't can't get their application in at other banks because they don't have a relationship. Yep, I agree. I think they may have. I think there was some news about them this morning. I can't point to it. Did uh, that cap get lifted? I think so. I think so. Well, I would think the government would have done that. Yeah, yeah I think we saw that too. So let me ask about about that that triage process. So I think the good news for our members <laughs> is our members are going to have better are going to be better positioned in terms of assets, right? And I guess when I'm thinking from the banker's perspective, some of the you know Joe's Bar and Grill comes in, 
what do they got that I want? And, and, and so what is the banks? Cause I, I don't think there's yet a secondary market for these things. And I think was it some of the, the banks concerned about having a lot of these loans on their books, especially. At I don't think so. These, these are hundred percent guaranteed. If, if I'm correct, is that right, Jen or Dave? Yeah, those they're supposed to be hundred percent backed. So the, the lenders really shouldn't have a lot of concern for my reading of the, the rules. Everything that came out really said that, you know, once those once those lending institutions release the funds, they are in a I think there was something within the uh, the interim final rule that came out on I think it was April 2nd. So it's something to the extent that the lenders are able to rely on the, certif- the self-certifications of the applicants. So whoever's submitting that, that application. And then SBA truly was holding the lenders harmless in that regard. And someone I spoke to from, um, I think she was with UMB this morning, uh, had indicated, yeah, they are relying 100% on the self-certifications. They as a bank are not providing any, you know, any insight. Are you eligible? They're leaving it up to that discussion of the applicant and either their accountants or their legal counsel. Um, so the lenders aren't taking any responsibility under that. And underneath the interim rule, they're not required to either. So they, they really shouldn't have a lot of fear. And especially, and David, correct me if I'm wrong on this timeline, but I believe that with the forgiveness component, once the lender receives um, the appropriate documentation, they have, I think, like a 60-day time frame to approve the documentation and then within 90 days, SBA is supposed to remit the reimbursement funds back to that lender. So I think there's a, I want to say it's a 60 and a 90 day time frame. So it's really fairly quick, you know, from a government standards perspective. So I, I really wouldn't think the lenders would be overly hesitant in having these because they are 100% backed. Oh, good. No, that's, that's, that's good news. Um, I want to jump into a couple of the questions that we've got in the chat box now. Um, and we got at this a little bit, but maybe you guys could talk a little bit a little bit more uh, about how, and I don't know how explicit the rules are in terms of how these um, expenses are going to be documented. So if we are relying on self-certification, so to speak, uh, in the loan process and the application process, on the back end, somebody's got to prove something in order for to achieve forgiveness, right? Yeah, I understand you. The, you actually have to apply to the bank for forgiveness. The bank gets to determine that, and uh, you just have to provide. I mean, the things they're asking for are pretty easily providable. And if uh, you know uh, uh, the payroll side, that's just a matter. In fact, we use Paycor. I think they're a national company now. They started in Cincinnati. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but they, uh, it was too late because we'd already done our application, but they now have, I think, some formal reports geared towards the PPL uh, or, or PPP program, right? Uh, which, which should make the payroll side of it easier to prove. Uh, and I think the, you know, the interest and the rents and typically that stuff's relatively easy to, to prove also. And especially if the bulk of this is payroll, that's probably even easier. Um, they're, they're looking to those substantiative records. So in the case, like John said, they're looking for 941s and payroll records that you'll be able to su- supply that document what was corroborating the expenditure. So kind of as we were talking about the, the documentation for corroborating, you're going to, and with the certifications, you're going to have the tax documents in place that support what you actually claim you use the expenses for. So documentation purposes really should be you know, kind of a standard business process at that point, and it it shouldn't be overly complex to be able to do that. the The application process, when when PPP first was um, publicized, they did indicate it was going to be a formal application, and now, kind of built in with all of these certifications, it's really just a matter of uh, providing that documentation as requested by your lender. So each lender could have slightly different documentation that they request, but ultimately they're going to have a checklist that says, you know. Give us the uh, the payroll register for your company from this time frame to this time frame, or supply this document, that document. So you should be able to follow that pretty cleanly in order to abide by the the ability to get that forgiveness component put into place. All right, anonymous. I can't ask you if that answered your question because you're anonymous, but well, hopefully it did. Um, <laughs> hey, Scott Iver, if you're out there, um, I thought I could unmute people from my 
uh, Starship Enterprise over here, but it doesn't look like I can. Can you um, unmute Greg? Uh, Greg asked two good questions here, and, uh, and and maybe we can just have a little dialogue with Greg since since he's got a couple of different uh, questions that he's asked. Greg, right. unmute yourself. How you doing, buddy? I'm good, thanks. Appreciate the uh, service here today. So it looks like you've got two separate issues. One is uh, trying to decide between two mutually exclusive components of the uh, PPP. One is the loan side that John's engaged with, and the other is the payroll tax. Uh, uh, employers uh, share of the payroll uh, tax forgiveness. Talk a little bit about what your what your thought process is there, and then let's have some dialogue on that. All right. Well, there's definitely two components. There's the you know we've all pretty much so far in this call been talking about the loan component. Uh, but then there's another half that is about all about payroll taxes. And there's there's kind of two components on the payroll tax half. And part one is, is uh, getting a forgiveness of your employer paid payroll taxes from, well, not a forgiveness, it's a, it's a loan yeah. on your not having to pay your payroll tax, employer payroll taxes between now and 1231, and then 50% of that would be due at the end of 21, and 50% would be due at the end of 22. So, you know, that, that's not obviously as lucrative as the other deals uh, so far, but then there, and there's another component of the payroll tax half, and that is the payroll tax credit, where you can get basically, in our case, you know, we're looking at around 60, 60 people, uh, that are kind of you know affected by this. I'm generalizing, but um, you can it can be up to a five thousand dollar credit per person. Now that's three hundred thousand dollars. So, and that that would be a credit. But um, you can't do any of the payroll tax stuff if you're also taking out a PPP loan. So of course you. So then therefore you got to pick one or the other. And of course on the PPP side, if it's going to be 100% forgivable, that's a no brainer because our, you know, that amount would be higher than the $300,000 I'm using in my example to begin with. But we don't really know for sure about the forgivability of it. And even like John said, even if it's not forgivable, you know, I think John's point was it's, it's a great deal. It's 1%, you know, it, why not take it? And I, I agree with that as well. But then you got it, but it's what makes it a little more difficult if you're comparing it to something like the, the payroll tax credit portion. Uh, and there's, you know, that there's some components you have to, there's some hurdles you have to meet there, but to me, they might be a little bit easier to make. They're a little more clear. And again, we just don't know. I, I'm just a little skeptical that the government's really going to forgive all this money. And that, that's basically my topic that I wanted to ask about. I think the banks though, I, I think the decision to forgive fits in a box and the banks, uh, I mean, once you apply the banks, if you think about it, they, they would want it to be forgiven because it makes your balance sheet stronger and that benefits a bank that already has a loan with you. So I, I, I think the bank's interests are, are more closely aligned with, with our own uh, as distributors. Uh, and I, the way I address these kinds of decisions, to me, it's just a math, a math decision, yeah. you know, add up, add up all the, you know, create your columns and add them up and pick the horse that benefits you most. Yeah, they definitely, one column is definitely more than the other column. It just, uh, I just have to assume that it's going to be 100% forgivable. And I, you know, I agree with what you're saying. It probably will be, it behooves the banks to do that, but you never know because it is more, uh, you know, it's less clear than the other half. Yeah, yeah that's all. Thanks for addressing. Sure, and I'll add one thing on to what John is saying um, because I, I completely agree. So from a banking standpoint, these loans are not typical bank loans in that they are uncollateralized, unsecured, unguaranteed. I mean, the, these guys, you know, the banks are, are basically an unsecured creditor. That, that is not a position any bank wants to be in, um, nor are they hardly ever in that position. So what I will say is that the, the SBA has 100% guaranteed these loans, which, which is a, a big deal um, for the SBA. And this debt is unsecured on the, on the bank's balance sheet. So to John's point, 
the banks want to get these things off their balance sheet as fast as possible because you have a group of distressed, downturned businesses getting monies that is unsecured and uncollateralized. That's not a position the banks are going to be in. So I, I, I agree with you on healthy skepticism and anything governmental related. You, you always have some skepticism of what might change. You know, this is one of those things where there's going to be a lot of really unpopular people, in my opinion, and it's an election year for, for one and, and a third of the others. So I, it, it would surprise me, Greg, but to your point, um, never say never. All right. Thanks, everybody. Greg, I'd also comment, just, just real quickly, in regards to the, the payroll component for what you're referring to, keep in mind too, like, and I think you understand this because of the, the timeline that you laid out, but that employer portion of the payroll taxes, that truly is a deferral, right? So we're not saving anything other than time value of money and, and maybe what we're using those funds for. So that component that was authorized under the legislation truly takes whatever your employer portion of um, FICA taxes, Social Security, Medicare, whatever those components were that were normally due by 1231 of this year, and it defers the payment 50% to the end of next year and 50% to the end of uh, December 31, 2022. So that component is just a deferral piece. The, the other component that you were referring to in regards to the, the credit for wages capped at that $10,000, so it's really a 5,000 credit per employee, those have two prerequisites in order to even complying with those. And, and those two prerequisites would be the fact that you really do have to show that you're impacted from an operations perspective by COVID-19. So you had, um, I believe the one threshold is either a full or a partial closure of your business, or that you've got at least a 50% drop within your first quarter earnings compared to last year. So those are two big hurdles to even be considered for that particular payroll tax credit uh, capped at that $10,000 per employee, which essentially is 5,000 employees. So just to kind of make sure that that's clear. And Ed, if you'd like, um, when everything's done here, we have some, some great resource materials that are available out on our website that would be a good link for everyone to be able to kind of peruse. I know David and Bianca and myself on the, the loan side have been really adamant about making sure that all of our materials are updated as the new guidance comes out. So everything out there you can, you know, go look at, rely on, even if it has an initial publication date of the end of March, we've, we've really tried to make sure that everything gets updated promptly and timely. And, and I want to thank David for his efforts on that as well. So definitely we can make that available. Yeah, definitely. And, and um, probably, like I said, later today or tomorrow, uh, everybody on the webinar, even if you didn't make this, because we had a lot more folks register than, than actually showed up. So they're probably looking for the replay. So we'll have an email go out with all these links. So any of the resources that, that, that Jen uh, and David can get us, we'll certainly um, attach to that uh, and put on our COVID resources page. So I've got 1053 and we have answered all open questions. So for the good of the order, I am going to uh, put out uh, one last call for questions um, from, the, uh, from the audience. You can raise your hand virtually or you can pop one into the Q&A box. Um, we do anticipate uh, Congress doing more, uh, having more action, like I said, at least to increase the appropriations uh, to go to, these, uh, to, the, to the PPP specifically, I think. Uh, and I know the Fed has been very active today with a variety of facilities, um, including one for companies that have more than 500 employees. Um, there is no uh, there's no forgiveness to that, but it is low interest uh, lending. Um, so we'll, we haven't seen a lot of detail on that, but we'll, we certainly will be looking into it. Um, I was interested, uh, I think it was David that mentioned the, uh, or it may have been Jen, I uh, apologize, that there were some flexibility possibly in the uh, 500 employee threshold, uh, depending on what NAICS code you're in. Um, if I don't have any additional questions, but if, if I, one of you who mentioned that in your remarks, if that rings a bell, uh, maybe, a little more about that, it, it, to what degree there might be flexibility in that for the PPP and that F500 employee threshold? Yeah, sure. Um, and I can, I'll take that real quick. So the, um, 
Treasury Department issued some FAQs. Um, this would have come out April 6th, and it was slightly updated on April 7th. And we can, we've got an article providing some more information on these as well that, that folks can read. But the original guidance was that you had to be under 500 employees unless you qualified as a franchise. Um, a Nike's code beginning with 72, which was uh, hospitality and food service, or you were receiving funding as a SBIC. Those were the three original over 500 exceptions. They came out with a new class of exceptions for borrowers with more than 500 employees. So within the Small Business Act, there's the definition of a small business concern. So you can, you can be eligible for the loan if you meet those size-based standards. And, and what that is going back to is based on the NIKES code, the SBA.gov has a NIKES specific size standard, which is either revenue or employee based. Um, so if you, if you can meet those size standards, they will, they will allow you to be eligible for the loan even if you have more than 500 employees. So think about a business that you know, might have a lot of employees, but because of the Nike standard, um, they're, they're still under a certain revenue threshold, you, you may apply. Um, and, and when I mentioned this, you know, these, these are the types of questions we can take you know, offline and, and please ask or email Jen and I, and we can drill into um, your eligibility, but that that is one to keep in the back of your minds. The other one, there's an alternative size standard that the SBA um, generally uses for small business concerns. So maximum tangible net worth, not more than 15 million. Um, tangible net worth typically just means let, let's pull out the goodwill um, or any sort of intangibles you have on the balance sheet and calculate worth um, or, or value. The other one being um, average net income after federal income taxes. So if over the last two years you've averaged less than five million, you would still qualify. So those those were two that that came out um, here uh, earlier this week, just two days ago, that would allow more businesses to qualify for the PPP process. And, and again, Jen and I are happy to answer questions offline. Um, the, the the takeaway with that is. Don't assume that you are not eligible for these loans. So, you know, do the homework, ask someone who has knowledge of this or someone who's gone through the process because there, there are a lot of rules with eligibility. And, and the, other, the other one is um, affiliation is kicking in as well. And there's four tests for affiliation to be considered. So I strongly recommend reaching out to your accountant or lender um, attorney to assess whether or not you're eligible and, and don't make any assumptions. Great. I want to get links to those tests and maybe put those on our uh, on our resource page uh, along with us because that's that's good information. I don't know if it's going to help many of us, but it's worth at least uh, being informed. Plus, if this thing continues to uh, evolve, we can uh, you know we can we can do some advocacy there. Um, okay, w one minute left, and we have two questions to answer. Does the forgiveness cycle begin the actual day the loan is deposited into your account? When does that forgiveness cycle begin? I think it begin. Uh, it, it actually, no matter when you get funded, doesn't it uh, relate to uh, was it March or uh, February fifteenth to June thirtieth? I forget exactly what the beginning date is. So the I know open the end period. Is it's it's based on the open period. Is that Jen or David? Is that your understanding? The so the loan is going to be based on funding. And that was a new rule that came out. I, I saw something yesterday that says you can wait up to 10 days for your bank to fund that loan. I'm trying to find a, the source document from that. But generally speaking, your eight-week forgiveness period begins with when you get the money. Okay. And that's, that's specific to forgiveness only. The other tests for loan amount and employee headcount and forgiveness reduction would be more qualified or covered period. This is just the eight week forgiveness expense cycle. Okay. And then one last question, uh, what records do they ask to see for reduction in revenue for the forgiveness hurdle? I don't know if that's been specified yet. 
is it just a PL for the period or I, I don't know? I don't I don't is there a requirement for reduction in revenue proof for forgiveness? Reduction there, in there, no, that, there's not. No, it's an employment. It's a it's an employment uh yeah. hurdle. The way I the way I the way I looked at the uh this whole program is the option is to pay us to pay employees to stay on the job yeah. versus us terminate people and the government give them money through the unemployment office. It's really a different type of unemployment program is the way I view it. Yeah, I think that's right. Lolita, does that, does that make sense to you? That, that was your question. You can kind of type yes or no in that open in that question box. I, but that's the case. It's not the, your forgiveness is not based on revenue reduction. It's based on keeping people on payroll. I think we've got you if you want to unmute and, and, and respond. That makes sense. All right, Lolita's shy. We're gonna let that one slide. But I, that's the that's the answer anyway. All right, so we are at 11.01, uh, went slightly over, but I wanna thank our panelists. You guys were fantastic. Very good answers to some, uh, some, some very specific questions. Um, I think Jen and David both offered, you know, if you want to email questions in, um, we'll, we'll continue to get you answers uh, as, as things change and evolve. We're here for you. We're happy to, you know, put us to work where um, you pay us to be advocates for you and to also, also help you run your business. So uh, take advantage of us. Lolita's unmuted now. She's calling me. Can I call you back? <laughs> okay. All right. That's good enough. Uh, but, but thanks, everybody, for your time. Jen. John, David, you guys are great. Thanks for Our your pleasure. help. Everybody stay safe. Social Thanks. distancing. Take care of yourselves. <laughs> Take care of your family. Take care of your people. All right. We'll see you later. Thanks, everybody. Take, take care. Bye-bye.